To the undiscerning tourist, it's mostly snow-clad mountains that epitomize Sikkim. But delve deeper in the melange of habitats that make up the 7,000 square kilometers of Sikkim is apparent. In a stark contrast to ice and snow, lush semi-deciduous and broadleaf forests thrive in the mid-elevations. Alpine scrub and meadows dominate the landscape at slightly higher altitudes. And further up, the roof of the world beckons. The Tibetan plateau fringes the northernmost bounds of Sikkim. These myriad habitats spread across elevations ranging from a mere 300 to more than 8,000 meters above sea level make the second smallest Indian state home to a stunning area of wildlife. The colorful Himalayan monarch, for instance, is one of the nearly 600 bird species found here. Dwelling in temperate and conifer forests, it shares its habitat with the state animal of Sikkim, the reclusive red panda and carnivores like the clouded leopard. But mystery shrouds most of these species and their habitats. And with the prospect of climate change looming large in these high altitudes, the dearth in ecological data further jeopardizes their conservation. To address this issue, the Department of Biotechnology with the National Center for Biological Sciences and the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment have set up an initiative engaging students to work on ecological questions in the state. Sponsored by the Department of Biotechnology, 12 researchers will collect field data and analyze it under the expert guidance of faculty from the NCBS and ATRI. This bid to generate ecological data traverses topics across Sikkim's varied ecosystems and the species they harbor. Even the snowbound areas of Sikkim abound with wildlife. Small carnivores such as leopard cats, yellow-throated martens, pale weasels, red pandas and foxes are integral components of this ecosystem, species that Sunita Khativara studies in Kyongnosla Alpine Sanctuary in East Sikkim. Khativara has placed camera traps along prominent animal trails to determine which carnivores are found here and how many they number, using principles based on the frequencies with which each individual is caught on reel. Camera trap images can also give her an indirect estimate of carnivore numbers in the area, data vital to carnivore management and conservation. But what of spots where cameras have not been deployed? That's where carnivore poop comes handy. Genetic analysis of animal cells trailing in feces can reveal the species it belongs to and show how different carnivores dwelling in the same habitats partition their spaces. A detailed examination of feces can also reveal the meat carnivores eat. And Khativara hopes to find out which mammals top the carnivore menu. Mammals that figure in this list include the Himalayan musk deer and goat antelopes like the Ciro and Bhural. But the numbers of these mammals often fluctuate with changes in seasonal vegetation, an aspect Tanushri Srivastava wants to understand better. Srivastava will assess herbivore presence using direct methods like camera trapping and indirect signs such as herbivore droppings. Srivastava will also quantify plant species across Kyungnosla to estimate the repertoire of plants that herbivores choose their food from. She also plans to scan musk deer, sero and goral droppings for female hormone levels. This, together with diet quality assessments, will open a window into the reproductive cycles of these species across seasons. While these large herbivores are important prey, the relatively diminutive pikas also form a substantial part of carnivore diet. Pikas dwell in the colder, high altitudes and consequently could be easily affected by phenomena such as global warming. However, akin to warmer temperatures that characterize this climatic change, Warming and freezing cycles have alternated over thousands of years in these high ranges. Nishma Dahal aims to study these historical effects 
by taking a sneak peek into the evolutionary histories using genetic analysis. Genetic signatures can also reveal how pikas disperse across parts of the cold Himalaya. Another aspect that will help the Hal put together the missing pieces of the jigsaw. To get her genetic data, the Hal traps spikers to obtain minuscule blood samples on which she conducts DNA sequence analysis. But even getting those minuscule samples are a Himalayan effort. The Hal has just finished sampling the world's deepest gorge, Kali Gantaki. Her work highlighting the dynamics of pika populations across hundreds of years could be crucial in unraveling the complex glacial history of the Sikkim Himalaya. Even as glaciers and snow cover fall prey to global warming worldwide, such changes in climate affect pika diet as well, which includes grasses and their high-altitude herb communities. Dharmendra Lamsar plans to analyze the Himalayan grass community's response to such warmer temperatures using experimentally induced warming. Lamsal has set up open-top chambers, small greenhouses that simulate global warming, hoping to understand what warmer climates could bode for plants in this area. He also wants to determine whether species composition, distribution, flowering patterns and morphology such as leaf size alter with changing temperatures. Lamsal is about to begin measuring nutrient and biomass levels in the laboratory which will give him clues to plant productivity in the landscape. His high altitude grassland communities are also composed of numerous herbs, some of them dazzling in their beauty. Primulas are one such family of wild flowers that thrive in cool climes and snow cover for most part of the year making them easily susceptible to changes in climate. To fathom which species are more or less likely to adapt to potential changes, Priyadarshini Guru will study patterns of genetic variation across altitudes in six primular species. In the valleys of Lachen and Lachung in northern Sikkim, she will also study the distribution, morphological features and flowering patterns of primulas. She walks transects and lays out vegetation plots to examine species diversity and pollinate the visitation rates. She also collects leaf samples to obtain DNA and RNA sequences to examine patterns of adaptation and plasticity to temperatures at the levels of genes. From snow sprinkled flows of petite primulas to dense emerald forests home to hundreds of orchids, Sikkim is a land of many contrasts where secrets wait to be unearthed. A perfect example are the lush, broad-leaved forests that tourists would find so unconventional of Sikkim. Unfortunately, these diverse ecosystems are also the most prone to rapid decline due to land use change and low protection. Knowledge of plant species that comprise this ecosystem, therefore, is of prime importance. Radhika Kanade is doing precisely this, sketching out elementary data by estimating tree diversity in North and West Sikkim. For this, she uses vegetation plots and has identified almost 150 woody plant species here. Kanade hopes to quantify leaf characteristics, photosynthesis and transpiration rates, wood density, temperature and rainfall levels to understand how biotic and abiotic factors shape these plant communities. In slightly higher altitudes, plant communities are dominated by large, towering oaks. They have a special place in the ecological and economic milieu of Sikkim. It's not just birds and small mammals that make homes in oaks. Numerous species of mosses, epiphytes and fungi thrive all over them making each tree a small ecosystem in itself. They also serve as sources of timber, fuel, agricultural fodder and even fruit for the locals. Yet, for trees that are so much a part of human and animal life, very little is known about them. Yang Chen Labutia 
seeks to find out where these trees are distributed across Sikkim and how many still remain. She's currently mapping the presence of oaks and beeches across parts of Sikkim. Bhutia will also examine regeneration patterns and the factors that drive the distribution of these trees. In addition to studying the characteristics of the leaves and fruits to understand their morphological traits in detail, she will also sequence their DNA to examine evolutionary histories. Apart from the myriad ways in which these oaks offer direct sustenance to life forms, the trees are also vital regulators of water resources in these tough terrains. Not just oaks, entire expanses of forests and grasslands serve as catchment areas for rainwater, helping recharge groundwater levels and sustaining ecological processes as well as human life. Studying the interactions of ecosystems and water, a field of study called ecohydrology, thus assumes great importance. Manish Kumar's doctoral thesis focuses on understanding precisely this relationship in the Sikkim Himalaya. Kumar has identified five streams in Kyongnosla, Kanjanjunga, and Frambanglo Wildlife Sanctuary. He records stream characteristics such as water flow and rainfall levels. While fieldwork has not been all rosy due to heavy rains and loss of equipment in sudden floods, Kumar hopes that his work will help to conserve and better manage the state's water resources. Ecosystems like these are perfect examples of how nature provides direct quantifiable benefits to mankind in the form of water, timber or food. But plant and animal communities interact with each other to provide numerous indirect benefits that are sometimes intangible. Pollination is one such service crucial to maintaining ecosystems. Flowers form fruits thanks to pollinators. But changing climate patterns can affect even these crucial processes. Changes can spell disaster for plants like the rhododendron. Another high-altitude specialist and the state tree of Sikkim, Shweta Basnet, hopes to analyze these changing patterns on rhododendron flowering and fruiting in Kyungnosla Alpine Sanctuary. Together with factors such as humidity, temperature and rainfall, Basnet will quantify the interactions between trees and their pollinators ranging from houseflies to bees and wasps. Basnet is currently identifying insect pollinators in the laboratory. She will also monitor night visits by nocturnal pollinators, an aspect she finds exciting and challenging. Preliminary results from her study suggest that rhododendrons are pollinated not only by insects, but also avians like sunbirds, laughing thrushes and warblers. The pollination benefits that wildlife offer to forest plants spill over to cultivated varieties as well. Forest patches embedded in the agricultural landscape of Sikkim house a multitude of wild pollinators. And these pollinators help produce the famous Sikkim mandarin orange. Urvashi Pradhan is studying the role of these pollinators in the fruit formation of this commercial crop. She hopes to understand how fragmented forest patches that harbour these pollinators provide the service across East, West and South Sikkim. Pradhan's field data collection is almost over, having completed numerous pollination experiments on oranges. Her work also includes interviewing farmers and mapping forest fragments and pollinator information using remote sensing techniques. Preliminary results from her study show that the common honeybee is one of the most important pollinators of the mandarin orange. At higher altitudes, homeflies hold this distinction. While orange farms are doing pretty well, a virulent plant disease has put Sikkim's large cardamom farmers on the back foot. Sap-sucking insects, called aphids, carry with them a pestilent bug, the cardamom bushy dwarf virus. This virus causes excessive sprouting of dwarf tillers in cardamom plants, resulting in lower fruits and ultimately plant death, a disease called furki. With many families in Sikkim and Darjeeling depending solely on their cardamom crops, Fiona Savary and Pushkar Sharma want to shed light on the spatial prevalence of this disease. 
While farmers have not always been obliging, Sharma has identified incidents of disease occurrence in most plantations across the state. He hopes to isolate causative factors using mapping and remote sensing data. Like orange orchards, cardamom plantations are also embedded in a landscape comprising of wild habitats and cultivated land. Savary and Sharma will determine if different environs change infestation levels of Furki. Savary will also analyze the genetics of the viral strains and the aphids to see how evolutionary processes are linked to spatial patterns of the disease. While that takes us across all the projects that the Sikkim DBT initiative comprises, the story doesn't end here. These projects focus on not just wild communities, but its interface with human activities. The Sikkim DBT initiative thus marks the beginning of intensive and holistic ecological research in the state. Most field sites will be monitored across seasons for many years to come, flagging off a new era of long-term research in the state. For the researchers who have spent anywhere between a month to three years in some of the most remote and harsh places of Sikkim, their experiences have been remarkable. While fieldwork has not been a bed of roses, the students are not complaining about the cruel cold or tough terrains. They agree that it's often the most inhospitable conditions in field that render them most beautiful. Field data collection also took them closer to the Sikkim that every tourist envisages. A serene, rustic countryside with friendly and peaceful people. Over the 15 days he spent there, our photographer was also smitten by the people of Sikkim and of course the place. Undeniably, Sikkim offers novel ecological landscapes, every nook and corner, throbbing with fresh systems of study, beauty and culture. Lying far, far beyond the comprehensions of any undiscerning tourist incapable of delving deep into the different facets that make up Sikkim.